panel uh, is going to look at one of the areas in particular where we have a lot of conversation today in food animal production, uh, and one that we alluded to earlier this morning. We touched on just a, a wee bit with the consumer panelists, but now we're going to really dig into the issue kind of uh, head on, and that's the concept of antibiotic use in animal agriculture and changing the narrative on what has become one of the key hot buttons, as we heard earlier. Our panelists for this, uh, we'll start with Dr. Leah Dorman, a friend of mine and fellow Buckeye. Dr. Dorman lives on her family's farm in Ohio. Uh, she is a member of the American Veterinary Medical Association, U.S. Animal Health Association, and the National Institute for Animal Agriculture. She's been trained as a foreign animal disease diagnostician to boot. These experiences have helped her gain deep insight into animal health issues. Her time as a large animal veterinarian is the foundation of her experience and knowledge. In her role with Fibro Animal Health, Dr. Horm uh, Dr. Dorman works to answer consumer questions and concerns as part of the company's commitment to encourage and support open dialogue about producing safe food, promoting animal health and balancing the needs of people, animals, and the planet. Next to her, Dr. Richard Raymond. Dr. Raymond was a rural family physician in O'Neill, Nebraska for 17 years and then established and directed Clarkson Hospital's Family Practice Residency Directorate in, Oklahoma, or in Omaha for 10 years. In January 1999, Dr. Raymond was appointed by then Governor Mike Johans to be Nebraska's chief medical officer. Dr. Raymond directed a large number of public health programs, including investigations of foodborne illness outbreaks and building public health preparedness. He also served as president of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Then in 2005, Dr. Raymond moved to Washington, D.C. when President George Bush appointed him undersecretary for food safety at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And that's when many of us got to know him rather well. In this position, Dr. Raymond was responsible for overseeing the policies and programs for the Food Safety Inspection Service, which regulated, of course, the meat and poultry food industry, and once again was a direct report to then Secretary of USDA Mike Johans. Now the good doctor consults and writes on food safety and public health issues from his home in Colorado and travels extensively around the globe, presenting to various animal health and animal agriculture related organizations in addition to medical and public health industry audiences. Finally, Christopher Deering is a Washington-based reporter who covers agriculture, food, and renewable fuels for the Des Moines Register and USA Today. Previously, Deering worked for Reuters in their Washington Bureau where he reported on Congress and covered the Agriculture Department as well as the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Outside of work, Deering's an avid runner and swimmer and fan of the Kansas City Royals, Milwaukee Brewers, and Green Bay Packers. Later you'll have to explain to me those uh, three selections, but hey, we've all got our particular crosses to bear, right? He lives on Capitol Hill with his wife, a Bloomberg reporter, and four-year-old son, Drew. They grow tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, strawberries, and potatoes. Great panel. Please welcome our three panelists. And similar to our panels, we've had um, each of our speakers will have five to seven minutes. Yep, you're up first, Dr. Dorman. Uh, please hold all your questions till all three presenters have had a chance to speak. And we'll come back up and uh, go through questions for all three of them together. So, Dr. Dorman, podium George. Which flipper? Which um, flicker? Try the first one. Pick one. To okay, let's see what happens. Oh, yes. <laughs> Perfect. Good choice. So Better than the other 50 50 chance there. <laughs> Well, I get to quote one of my favorite university past presidents, right, the Ohio State University, um, Dr. Gordon Gee. Oh, I heard some Buckeyes in the crowd. That's great. This is one of my favorite quotes. I had the opportunity to hear him speak several times, and I love this quote. And he said, in this time of enormous change and challenge comes enormous opportunity. And I think we can all agree that the antibiotics issue has certainly, is certainly going to cause us to change some things, or we're going to change some things here in the next uh, year and the next seven months to be exact. But then it's also been a challenge, a huge challenge. But with all that comes opportunity. And today I want to talk a little bit about that opportunity. So I already, I already said there's change ahead, right? Well, guess what? We've all talked about what the consumer wants to know. They not only want transparency, they expect transparency. And they want to know more about where their food is grown and how it's grown and raised. And this provides us a perfect opportunity to talk to them. Talk to them about what we do and why we do it. There are some changes, as you know. Many of you heard the terms FDA, so the Food and Drug Administration's Guidance for Industry 209 and 213. 
That's a big, long, that's a big, long phrase. But basically, we have a golden opportunity to talk about those documents and the changes that we're making. And here's in a nutshell, and I'm just going to give some bullet points of what those changes are. So for antibiotics important to humans, we are eliminating growth promotion for those list of antibiotics. And when I talk about antibiotics that are important to humans, I'm talking about those shared class antibiotics. I'm talking about the antibiotics that either has the same antibiotic that we use in animal agriculture that we also use in humans, or they're in the same family of medications. But then we're also increasing oversight. So what does that mean? We're increasing oversight by veterinarians. So that is where VFD, those other initials, veterinary feed directive, so for any of those medications, those antibiotics important to humans, for those medications, we will be moving to a veterinary feed directive, which is very similar to a prescription that a veterinarian has to write to allow us to use those medications in feed. And then the, those same medications will become prescription for water. And this is part of what we're doing. And here's the great part of the story. We're making some changes, folks, and we have a golden opportunity in the next seven months to be able to talk about this because we're doing our part in animal agriculture. We're doing our part to ensure that we are using antibiotics responsibly. And that is a very important message to get out to consumers. Whoops. The other thing, I think the other opportunity is we have an opportunity to really reframe the conversation about animal antibiotics in agriculture and really reframe, framing those in, in terms of societal benefits. How does it benefit the animal? How does it benefit the planet? And how does it benefit me as a consumer for public health? And I'm going to show you a video that I think does a pretty good job. You'll, you'll recognize some familiar faces. And Andy, I get to one-up you. Oh, wait, I get to two-up you because I have three daughters. And you get to meet them plus my husband and even my dog. So if you wouldn't mind rolling that, thank you. life on the farm. Can I do a more of some over here? Yeah, a little bit. With our kids' activities, caring for our livestock, and making sure my family gets safe, wholesome food. It's a challenge some days. But as consumers, that's what we all want and deserve. And that's why antibiotics are important. They keep farm animals healthy, which helps to improve food safety for all of us. I know there are questions about how antibiotics are used on the farm. It's simple, really. Farmers use antibiotics in farm animals for the same reason antibiotics are used in people. To treat, control, and prevent disease that causes pain and suffering. Antibiotics are given in a number of ways. For example, in water and feed, in pill form, and by injection. Sometimes we can apply the antibiotics directly to an infection. When an animal is sick with a bacterial infection, it can spread quickly. So we treat the animals that are nearby to keep them healthy too. Yeah, you're pretty tame, aren't you? Treating a sick animal and preventing sickness with the right medicine is absolutely the right thing to do. As a veterinarian, I take an oath to protect animal health and to make sure we all stay healthy too. Antibiotics are one of our most important tools and they've been used for decades on the farm. Keeping animals healthy has the added benefit of making food more affordable while using fewer natural resources. I'm proud to be a veterinarian, a mom, and a farmer. And I'm proud to be a part of a dedicated community that's committed to keeping animals healthy. There are two other videos on our website as well, and animalantibiotics.org is where you can find those. That's the how and why we use antibiotics in animal ag, but there's also one about resistance and one about residue as well. And I, but I hope you heard some messages there about, about the societal benefits and what is the benefit to the animal. Treating a sick animal is absolutely the right thing to do, and we need to talk about it in terms of animal care, and we don't always do that. 
And then I think you also heard in, in, that, in that short video, it affects public health as well, reducing the amount of bacteria that is entering into the plant, allowing farmers to food, produce food more effectively. Because if we healthy animals eat less food, less food means less acres needed to grow their feed, which is a lower carbon footprint. We need to be thinking about it like that as well. Now, that being said, I love food choice. I love the fact that we can go into the grocery store and have all this wonderful selection. Consumers in the U.S. have that, and we are very privileged to have that. And consuming meat that is raised without the benefit of antibiotics is one choice. And if you feel better and more comfortable, ultimately we want everyone to be comfortable with our food choices, that's just fine. That is absolutely fine. But there are many consumers out there that are perfectly comfortable with conventionally or traditionally raised animals. Okay, I had to get a little humor in there somewhere. Well, it looked easy when the dang horse did it. Now, I want to tell you that there are companies out there that do an excellent job of antibiotic-free, raised without antibiotics, no antibiotics ever, whatever you want to phrase that. There are companies out there that really do a very, very good job. But there are some unintended consequences that I think we have to be really conscious of. And so I'm going to talk about some of those. And I've got a few quotes up here just because I want you to know there are other folks thinking about this as well. ASPCA, or the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, being one of them. And one of their quotes is, if an animal welfare is not addressed in conjunction with pulling back the drugs, this could actually be a very dangerous move for birds and ultimately for consumers. And I'm going to jump to the last line as well. AAAP is the American Association of Avian Pathologists. Um, AASV is the American Association of Swine Veterinarians. They both have position statements about the use of antibiotics. And AA, the, so the avian folks, the, the poultry folks, say animal welfare is enhanced because of sick animals being adequately treated to decrease mortality and morbidity as well as the risk of disease transmission. And then the swine folks say marketing programs should not prevent a farmer from treating or preventing illness. Something else to think about. As, and I'm, I'm talking mainly from the poultry side here. As more and more companies go 100% antibiotic free or raised without antibiotics, there are some things we, we need to think about. What are the options when birds get sick? If they are 100%, what are the options? Well, you treat the birds and divert. And by divert, I mean you market them differently. Well, that's great if, you're, if you are raising birds for a company that has a portion antibiotic-free and the rest are conventionally raised. Pretty simple to, fairly simple, I should say, to, to go ahead and move those over. But if they're 100% antibiotic-free, marketing differently requires some potential different labeling, some different packaging, and it becomes pretty complicated. It becomes even more complicated when you're talking about Canada. They have a quota system there, and they even have contract actual agreements between the grower and, and the plants that are harvesting those birds. So it becomes very complicated for them. And then the second option is withhold treatment and sell those that survive. So I have my first issue with that, obviously, is from an animal care perspective. I took an oath that said I'm going to prevent and relieve animal suffering. We need to treat those birds if they're sick. But then selling those that survive, how does that affect us? How does that affect the consumer? Well, one of the issues in studies will show that as those birds, as they recover, and you always have this issue with, with animals that have been sick, sometimes have pathology internally, as they go to the plant, there are times when there is some pathology that can make more food processing errors. And if there are more errors, that runs the potential for food safety risks. And, more, and even on the other hand, more condemnations even even before they get that far. And the third and the ugly one to talk about is disposal. I don't think we're here yet. I hope we aren't, because disposal means I don't have a way to market them. I don't want to treat them if I don't have a way to market them. I don't want to not treat them, so what do I do? And disposal is certainly an option. I hope we never get there, because I believe that's a complete waste of animal life and a complete waste of resources but it's something we need to think about. I had the opportunity to sit in a, an Iowa turkey grower shop, and, and he raises for a popular sandwich company that has recently gone antibiotic-free. And um, here's what he said, and this was a quote. I told him I was going to quote him. The company wants antibiotic-free, and they're willing to pay for it. 
And then I saw this kind of stressed look come across his face, and he said, but when these birds have E. coli, that means I have to watch a percentage of them die. Is that fair? Is it fair to the birds? Is it fair to the farmer? Is it fair to the consumer? And is it fair to the consumer that is low income because it's going to raise the cost of their food? Fibro, my company that I work for, Fibro Animal Health, is working on educational awareness of the issues with food companies, stakeholders, and consumers as well. We support the responsible use of antibiotics to keep animals healthy, which we believe is the right thing to do. So action items. They asked me to talk about action items. So here's some things I think we can do, and that is communicate shared values and ethics behind antibiotic use. And I think we've heard this before. Nobody, know, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Lead with your values when you're talking to folks because they don't care about the science until they trust you. They don't trust you. They don't trust your science. So connect with them before you can talk about the science. That will give you the permission to talk about the science. Reframe the conversation about societal benefits. And then I think the other big one is highlight the changes, the things that we're doing. We're making some changes here, folks. Highlight those when you're talking to consumers, because we are, we are really working to do, to do the right thing. Resources for you folks. Um, two websites, and y'all, there's some handouts. There's some handouts scattered amongst your tables. ExploreAnimalHealth.org, that is a food system website, so that's geared more towards your folks with some deeper knowledge. AnimalAntibiotics.org, that's really geared towards consumers. Resource pages, my blog, the videos are here. And then one of my favorite websites is the Center for Food Integrity's Best Food Facts, and they do have uh, an antibiotics section with some videos as well. You're always welcome to contact me. I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, and um, you can even contact me directly from the websites. Thanks for your time. Thanks for having me. We're going to take a look at this a little bit from the human medicine side. <clears throat> and my, uh, my three take-homes Leo, you may have to come up here and run that for me. Try the other one. They may have flipped computers. Try that one. Ta-da. Well, my take-homes, I'll let you know right now so you can sleep through the rest of the presentation and just wake up when we get to these three. One is we don't have enough knowledge to make uh, a whole lot of policy changes the way we use antibiotics. The knowledge, I mean, we don't know how much interaction there is between animal health and human health. How much does the impact of using all these antibiotics in animals have on my health as a human being and antibiotic resistance. And first of all, antibiotic resistance is very real, it is very increasing, and more people are dying from antibiotic resistant bacteria every year in this country. It's not to be belittled, it's a real concern to everybody that ever has to take an antibiotic. But we don't know about that interface. There's very little crossover in antibiotics used in both animals and humans. The one that Leo was talking about, they, they call, it, call them uh, antibiotics of importance to medicine means if they're written in a prescription for a human being, they're important, they're not going to be used as, as growth promoters anymore. We get that. But the other uses of antibiotics for control, prevention, and treatment of diseases in animals still remains very little crossover, and I'll give you some numbers. My goal today is so you can take facts and have a discussion and say, this, this isn't Raymond's opinion, these are the facts from the FDA page, consider this. Uh, and then lastly, I believe the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, has been very responsible over the last 20 years, and I'll give you a couple examples there, that you can also use in a conversation. Antibiotic resistance. What do we know? Maybe better yet, we should say, what do we not know? One of my good friends, Guy Lonergan, another uh, uh, food scientist down at Texas Tech now, said, if you think you understand antibiotic resistance, then it has not been properly explained to you. I wish it was my quote. I always give him credit. But the example to back that up is Staph aureus. We're running out of drugs to treat Staph aureus. We've got Versa, we got MRSA, we got carbapenem resistant. You get MRSA today, your chances of dying are pretty good. But yet, penicillin remains the drug of choice for syphilis and strep throat. Why? We don't know. We simply don't know. Methicillin was invented in 1955. The first case of MRSA was in 1956. Animals weren't using methicillin, and doctors weren't under-prescribing it. It's not a pill you go home and take for three days and feel better you stop. No, it's an IV drug. So is it given the right drug for the right dose for the right length of time, and MRSA, their staff developed resistance in one year? We simply do not know. 
The World Health Organization doesn't know either. They came out with their first ever report in 2014 on antibiotic resistance as a world problem. 232 pages long, there were just four pages devoted to agriculture. And in those two page, four pages, these two quotes I, I remember uh, stressing the fact to me that we don't know what causes antibiotic resistance. The magnitude of transmission from animal reservoirs to humans remains unknown, and more data are needed to identify priority areas for intervention. So the people calling for more intervention, saying this recent FDA announcement is not going far enough, if the WHO says we need data before we can even identify what to do, how can consumer activists say we know what to do, we need to quit control, control and prevention use of these antibiotics? And they throw out that number, 80% of all antibiotics used in this country are, are, are sold for the use in animals. That is a number that we're going to dispel today. The number, 80%, is close, but it's not just to treat healthy animals raised food. It's also to treat sick animals. It's also used for companion animals like cats, dogs, and pets. It also is measured in kilograms. If you take Keflex for your sinusitis, you'll take 2,000 milligrams a day. If you take doxycycline, you'll take 100 milligrams a day. Treating the same infection, one with 100 milligrams, one with 2,000 milligrams. So the measurement is in kilograms. When I give you these numbers, it's kilograms, but it's the only numbers we have, and it's the numbers the activists use. So of that 80%, we'll just give that as a given, but it's for all animals. Of that 80%, in the latest report, which is 2014 use, sales, Ionophores were 31% of that 80%. Ionophores are not used in human medicine and never will be because they're very toxic to the human body. They're used to prevent a parasitic disease, primarily in uh, cattle and chickens, a disease that can wipe out a flock in a short period of time. But it's a parasitic disease that you're not going to go to the doctor and take a pill for. You don't have to worry about it. So it's, that's of no importance to human medicine. The second dot there is not individually reported. If, if, a, if a drug has only two sponsors or less, they don't report them out individually. So there's 8% of antibiotics that were sold in 2014 fall in that category. I can't tell you what classes they are because the FDA doesn't report it. But the FDA does say in the report, this 8% are not used in human medicine. They separate that out. So right now we've got 39% not used in human medicine. The most common antibiotic used in animals are the tetracycline class, which totaled 43% of all antibiotics sold for use in animals in 2014. It represented 2.5% of antibiotics sold for use in human medicine. And if you don't believe me on that, just go ask your doctor when the last time he or she prescribed oxy or chlorotetracycline, and they'll just laugh. It's, it's, there is a little bit of crossover. I actually took a tetracycline a year ago when I went to Indo Indonesia as a prophylaxis for malaria. I didn't even know that was a use for it until I went over there. But, so there's still some prescribed, but you're not going to get it from your doctor's office. We used to use it to treat acne in teenagers a long, long time ago, but there's a lot better stuff now. So 82% of antibiotics sold for use in animals are either not used in animals or are very, are not used in humans or very rarely used in humans. So it's the 18%. That's the number we want to look at. Not 80%, 18%. And I'm going to give you here the top five antibiotics prescribed by physicians, MDs, in this country. And I put a brand name after it so you kind of recognize it. A lot of people won't know what a macrolide is, but the, most people will know what a Z-Pak is. So those are the top five, and those are the percentage share of human medicine. Those five categories represent 88% of all antibiotics sold for use in in human medicine, and I would guess it's like 99% of antibiotics used by your uh, family practitioner or internist or pediatrician in an outpatient setting. These are important drugs. 88%. Now, of those five classes, two of them, the cephalosporins and the fluoroquinolones combined, represent less than 0.2% of antibiotics sold for use in animals because of the FDA's action, which I'll get to in just a minute. So let's take a look, and that's 25% of those five categories used in human medicine. So let's take a look at the three other categories that I listed. We're not going to talk about cephalosporin and fluoroquinolone because they're not used in animals, except in some small animal practices to treat actual infections, but they cannot be used for control or prevention or growth promotion in the industry. Now, I have not seen this anywhere except in my blogs, and I don't know why. 
The industry is not talking about this. When the two I, I was just giving you numbers from the 2014 report, but when the 2013 report came out, the activists, the sales were up 1%. That was the headlines that you saw. Antibiotic sales in animals up 1%. The sky is falling down. We're on the brink of a public health crisis, according to Cardinal Roman Slaughter. But if you go into the report and look at those three categories, they're used in both animals and humans. From 2012 to 2013, the macrolides, that's the ZPAC, Thailand in, in, in animal talk, was down 9%. Penicillin use was down 14%. And sulfa drugs were down 22%, while tetracyclines went up 9%. That's why the 1% rise, because tetracyclines, remember, 43% of all drugs, so when it goes up 1%, that's pretty big. Now, one year doesn't make a trend. So now we'll take a look at the 2014 report compared to 2012, and we see now that sulfa's down 9%, penicillin's down 9%, macrolide sales were leveled. Tetracyclines went up another 11%, and ionophores went up 3%. So I say the take home here is we are moving in the right direction. This doesn't take into account the size of our herds and flocks. It's kilograms. It's not perfect. But over the last two years, since the FDA made the announcement that Leah talked to you about, Federal Guidance 209, 213, and the VFD, since they made that announcement and said January 1's coming, 2017, you're not going to be able to use these antibiotics anymore, they're already phasing them out for that purpose, probably. They're changing animal husbandry, at least, and the, and the antibiotic sales are going the right direction. And I don't think our flocks are getting any smaller. Okay, back to those two drugs, the cephalosporins and the fluoroquinolones that were banned. From 2002 to 2012, using the National Antibiotic Resistance Monitoring System, there's a combined USDA, FDA, CDC. They, they look at bugs, they look for resistance. They saw a huge rise from 10 to 28% of resistant cephalosporin, salmonella, and chickens in 10 years. That's a big jump. That drug is often the drug of choice to treat kids with salmonellosis if it's serious enough to be in a hospital. We were losing that drug. Fluoroquinolones is the drug of choice for adults, but kids, little kids can't take fluoroquinolones, so we were, we were losing that. So in, two, in 2015, the FDA said no more cephalosporin for use in feed or water for control or prevention in feed animals just to treat infections is all. The FDA in, 19, or in 2005 also banned the use of fluoroquinolones in feed and water. Banned it completely for poultry industry. And that's because fluoroquinolones were FDA approved in 1998 and by 2005 we already saw 25% salmonella resistant to fluoroquinolones. In Europe it's 50% resistance because they still use fluoroquinolones in their poultry. This is an international problem. I don't care what steps the FDA takes to help us. It, it, if, unless we get the world together, we're going to have a problem. But the FDA has banned those two drugs that I showed you. Banned it from the science. They had the data to make that move. There are some people still critical of it. Some people still want Batril back in their chickens. But it's never going to happen, I guarantee you. Because uh, they saw a trend going. So those are your three take-homes again. Uh, we don't have the knowledge to make big sweeping policy changes. We don't even know if, if there's a much cross-reaction. Uh, we know there's very little crossover in antibiotic sales. There is some. Macrolides would be my area to take a good hard look at because I want that ZPAC to be the drug of choice for my doctor when I get my sinusitis or bronchitis if he wants to treat it. And then I, I, I do believe one of the messages is the FDA is responsible for this and they're doing a pretty darn good job. That's my belief. Oh, one last thing, uh, tailing a little bit on what Dr. Dorman said. When you are talking to a mother or a father, they don't want to hear about increased efficiencies. They don't want to hear about how much more beef and milk and eggs we produce on the same amount of land. They don't want to hear about a starving world that can't afford meat. They want to know if that meat is good for their kids and safe. And that's the FDA's, my message to you is the FDA is keeping it safe from the antibiotic part of it. Thank you. So I'll know if my speech and remarks here was successful if you don't applause, because then I know I've kind of, yeah. You know, as a reporter, I don't want the applause. Because <laughs> um, then you know you've made somebody happy and somebody not. But anyway, good afternoon, and, and thanks for inviting me today. Um, 
First, I'm just going to begin by talking a little bit about communication and ag and um, what I do, and then I'll go a little bit more detail on antibiotics. But I've been covering agriculture now for more than 15 years, and in just the last four alone, the subject of basically what's in my food has become a bigger story uh, that shows no sign of abating. More companies are capitalizing on it, and as you probably are aware, more journalists are writing about it. In our case, many of those agriculture stories that go to USA Today, the Des Moines Register, and other Gannett papers involve topics such as antibiotics, GMO ingredients, and the removal of artificial colors and flavors. They are immensely popular with our readers, often drawing more viewers than other agricultural items. One of the things I tell people about covering agriculture and why it's a fun topic to write about is the variety of issues from ethanol to commodities to trade and to food. Everyone has to eat and everyone cares about food in some capacity. Increasingly, the proliferation of websites, blogs, Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook have given more people with varying degrees of credibility additional platforms to express their views. That makes it increasingly harder as a reporter when you know, it doesn't take much for someone to post something and it becomes a big issue. Um, you know, we're not just looking at competitors, we're you know, routinely looking at websites, um, what other people have tweeted. There's a lot more venues and avenues now for us to use to monitor for news in addition to those that you know, we get from many of you and from traditional news outlets that are our competitors. Uh, the internet can take a single comment and give it a life of its own, captivating, captivating the attention of people including the media for days. Just ask producers of lean, finely textured beef, or as some characterized it four years ago, pink slime. The fallout over the additive was swift, prompting at least one beef processor to file for bankruptcy and others to cut back production temporarily. My point here is that the changing communication landscape makes it vital for those involved in agriculture to be more out front and more transparent than they have been in the past maybe even beyond what they've been previously comfortable doing. It only takes one person to discredit what you have spent years and large amounts of money trying to communicate, to communicate to people like me. That brings me back to antibiotics. A growing number of companies such as McDonald's, Chick-fil-A, Subway, Panera Bread, Purdue, Costco, Tyson Foods, uh, Cargill, Smithfield, Pilgrim's Pride, among countless others, have made some type of announcement in the past few years about their plans to scale back or eliminate antibiotics used to produce the meats and poultry they serve to customers or process at their plants. Many of those we've written about, particularly in the case of you know, the bigger name players, your McDonald's. Um, yeah, it, it seems like now, uh, from a journalist perspective, we're, we're seeing these you know, once a week. and, and Unless it's a, a big player or someone that really moves the needle, again, like a McDonald's, it, it sort of has, it, it's lost the impact just because it's happening so frequently. Um, Subway, Chick-fil-A, and Purdue, for example, um, have uh, not only announced their plans, but followed up with their uh, showing that they are honoring their commitments. For its part, Subway has touted how it kept its promises and claimed victory in doing so before its rivals. In just the last few weeks, I've seen signs uh, at Shake Shack touting uh, their burgers. That's what you see um, in the middle there. Um, uh, Subway running com uh, TV commercials and posting signs on their restaurant doors, the one on the right there, um, announcing their antibiotic-free rotisserie-style chicken. Even a local restaurant my wife and I went to recently with a four-year-old son in Hyattsville, Maryland, sells antibiotic-free locally raised chicken tenders on its kids menu. It's a top thing right at the top there, if you can, you can see it. Um, it wants to make sure that parents know. With growing demand for meat and poultry from animals not treated with antibiotics, more companies are pledging to make changes, many of them I noted a moment ago. But some of the inherent skepticism that has arisen from consumer groups that I routinely follow and hear from through email, phone calls, is, um, you know, what happens next? Uh, how can the public know that the industry is following through on eliminating antibiotics from its supply chain? I'd like to think, at least from my perspective as a journalist, I, I 
you know, I can't speak for everyone, but I enter every story with some degree of skepticism. And, you know, when, when I'm writing a story like this, I like to have, you know, obviously the industry perspective, consumer group perspective, an academic, uh, you know, maybe the FDA or, or whoever, it is, uh, you know, whatever regulatory agency is in the story in some capacity so that each side of the story has a chance to basically give their, their opinion and their views. Um, you know, there's a, gr a degree here of trust that a company is going to eliminate the drugs from the products within the time they promised. The headline announcing the commitment is what we as journalists write about. For the most part, though, not enough is, uh, attention is devoted uh, to what happens later on. Uh, for me as a company or industry and, and as a journalist, what I really want to know about is you know, what is being done to verify those claims? You know, are you following through on what you promised? You know, maybe it's a fault of, of journalism here, but, you know, oftentimes we're writing the headline announcement and not enough is really being done to go back and follow up to see, you know, is what was pledged several years ago actually, you know, been, been uh, fulfilled. I think this is the next part of this evolving story. The decision by companies making the switch is no longer the top story. It's what they are doing now, and if they are following through on what they promised. This becomes even more paramount when consumers are bombarded almost daily with announcements from companies that are changing the ingredients they use in their foods, such as GMO-free or stripping out artificial color and colors and flavors, or using eggs from cage-free birds. The list goes on and on. It leads to a, a confusing message where the issues risk being lumped together blending these announcements into one confusing basket that blurs what is safe and what is not, what is true and what is not. One other point, this overload risks overwhelming consumers who are already distracted. With all these announcements, there is a risk that the public forgets, or worse yet, gets confused that what one company is doing is actually being done by someone else. I'm not here to cast praise or criticism surrounding what is being done involving antibiotics. It's a fascinating topic to write about as a journalist, and one that I'm certain will not go away anytime soon. And as much as it's possible, transparency and effective communication from all parties involved will go a long way toward giving added heft and validity to these sweeping changes. Obviously, you know, as a journalist, you know, we encourage uh, opening up, you know, being as transparent as you can. I know. Um, you know, for us, that makes doing our job a lot easier and makes it a lot easier for us to get your views, your opinions, you know, out there to the readers. Um, I look forward uh, to answering any questions you may have, and uh, thank you for having me today. Okay, so as we've been doing, let's take a few questions from the floor and we'll ask each of our panelists to share their action, please, uh, suggestion, tip, or, or recommendation with the group as well. But uh, let's start with questions from the floor for our panelists. While, you, while you're waiting for a question, I just want to point out on that kids menu, it said antibiotic free. It didn't say raised without antibiotics. So I think that was not a bird raised without antibiotics. I think they're just claiming their meat is antibiotic-free, which all meat is. All meat is. Yeah. Terminology matters, right? Question. This is for Dr. Dorman. Uh, where do we stand on the Carbidox issue right now? You thought you really thought you were going to get through the whole thing without having to talk about that, right? You asked me that last time. <laughs> no. So the short answer is we have, uh, we have requested a hearing with FDA. And we we were waiting, so stay tuned. I don't know if I have a long answer. That honestly, at this point, that's all I know. Okay. Am I right? Uh, this is for Christopher. So, what does a Shake Shack tell you when you ask them to verify? I mean, there was a long list of claims. Um, I've tried to look. Ask them was an answer. It's not on their website. What do they tell you when you ask them to verify these claims? I mean, to be fair, I guess I just pulled this when I was actually running down the stairs trying to catch my four-year-old, but uh, so, I, so I took this picture. But I mean, I haven't actively gone in there to ask them to verify these claims. Um, I mean, I'm not sure how one would go about, you know, trying to verify that what they are claiming on their sign is actually what they're doing. Um, you know, I mean, it would be, and furthermore, I mean, you know, if I was going to be singling out one company, I mean, I'd have to be 
trying to do that for for all the rest, and uh, you know, it wouldn't be fair to be targeting one one company. But it is an interesting question, though. I mean, it would go back maybe to that Tampa Bay story was mentioned earlier, uh, but was really popular a few weeks back, right? The uh, might be a good story for an enterprising young journalist to take on to <laughs> to dig into some of those claims, though. That's a great question. Because there are a lot of them out there, right? And we see we've talked about a lot of them today, and no one ever asks. I think, how do you verify this? What do you mean by this? The antibiotic-free kids menu is a great example. All meats antibiotic-free. Yeah, so that's. And, and I mean, there I are think. ways to verify. I mean, there are several safeguards in place to ensure that our meat is safe to eat. Sure. Um, certainly, that's you know withdrawal time that we all have to abide by as farmers and also as veterinarians. But then also there's there's testing done by food companies as well as in the plant to make sure that 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 food is fine. Yeah. Okay. You got one uh, right in the back row. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my uh, question is for Dr. Dorman as well. Um, we here work for an animal health company. I think similarly someone in the front from Alenco asked a similar question. We sometimes struggle coming from the manufacturer side about going direct to consumer because we're afraid that our message is not going to be heard or received as well because it's, um, I think we all know why, right? So um, how did your company go about making the decision to go direct to consumer and what has the reception been thus far? Great question, and there's no doubt that to some extent, you know, first of all, I usually I introduced myself as I'm a mom, so I'm like you, consumer, and I'm concerned about the food that I'm feeding my family. Um, I'm, a, I'm a veterinarian, so I have a background in science, but um, also in animal health and, and care. But yes, um, indeed. Uh, I'm also a farmer, by the way, but I also work for an animal health company, and um, does that make me a bit of an industry shill in some eyes and, you know, some chuckles? And the answer is yes, I'm sure it does. But um, as far as how well it's been received, you know, so far pretty well. Um, we've just really s launched our websites, the, the two websites that you saw um, at the end of February, early March. So they're still pretty new, so we're still kind of gauging how much the reception is. But then um, we've also had the opportunity to do a food blogger tour. And we invited food bloggers to come to the farm, and we toured a hatchery, uh, a, a poultry, a broiler hatchery, as well as a, a broiler house. And um, consumers, most of them had no background. Maybe one had a little bit of farm background. And I got to tell you, I was pleasantly surprised. You know, I was very concerned that they were, and they even flat out said in their blogs, I was going to, I was concerned I was going to walk away being a vegetarian. And they walked away saying, you know what? We get it. We understand there are teams of experts, nutritionists, veterinarians, farm managers, and people making sure the ventilation is correct, et cetera, making sure that those animals are cared for in the best way possible every day. And they got the whole idea about vaccines and antibiotics and their importance in the whole picture of the animal health toolbox. Now, there's a great action, please, example for you. Dr. Dorman talks about, I'm, I'm a mom, I'm a veterinarian, she connected the dots on a few really important sort of shared values or, or roles or uh, things that, that apply to her that maybe would resonate with people in the room. Uh, I always include the picture of one of my cows and the picture of my baby girl because that helps me connect with people in this audience, it be the cow and moms and, and dads that have little kids and then we can connect. Dr. Raymond I always take as credible because I, I think about, if he says something that's what my family doctor would say. I always picture Dr. Raymond as my family doctor. So, you know, those are kind of ways maybe when we're communicating with folks, what are the shared values or the issues or things that you have in your life that maybe will trip somebody else's trigger? Last parting shot as you get ready to leave. Well, I was going to say I usually bring pictures of my three grandkids, too, yeah, but sure. with a five to seven minute limitation, I didn't think I had time. Let's, let's, you, let's, you've seen them. Yeah, they're adorable. Yeah. Thank God they don't look like you, right? So, I what's like, the, I'm a, I, And I must look old if I look like your doctor. What's, the, uh, what's your action, please? Uh, each of you will get your action, please, recommendation or, or suggestion for the, yeah. Oh, we're going to do one more question, I'm being told. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, sure. well, one more quick. Uh, touching on what Dr. Dorm just talked about here a minute ago about antibiotic withholding, things like that. How do we take that story to the consumer? Earlier we heard that the government needs to maybe get more involved in telling this story. All the testing that goes on. I work in the dairy industry. Milk's tested numerous, numerous, numerous times to make sure it's, there's no antibiotics in it. 
And that seems to be a piece of the story that's not getting to the consumer, that we have a great safety mechanism to make sure of that. Dr. Wayne, a question. Yeah. Uh, it might be mine. Milk, of course, is FDA, but you can honestly say milk is the most tested food in America. But you can also say the USDA is in charge of testing for antibiotic and other residues in all the meat and poultry in this country. And we very, very rarely have any violations. And unfortunately, it is coming from your industry sometimes. It's an old spent dairy cow that just didn't have, you know, it was on her last legs and they wanted to get her to the sale barn. But it's very rare that we find it, even in, in dairy cattle and bob veal calves. We never find it in, in, in pork or, or steers. So. We're, the USDA is doing the testing. That, I just hate it when somebody says antibiotic free because I don't know what they mean. Right. And, and, and that's an approved label from the USDA. I'll take the blame for that. I tried to get rid of it, but I couldn't get it done in four years. It's pretty tough to do anything that simple at the USDA. <laughs> but, but, by the way, your, your labels that are approved are raised without antibiotics, and that better, you better not be using Ionophorus because we had to put one company down for that. You can say raised without antibiotics except Ionophorus, and that would just tend to scare the heck out of most people, and you can say antibiotic free. And I'm not sure any one of those really describe what's going on because some people say we raise without antibiotics, but they're using Ionophorus, which is technically an antibiotic in this country. In Europe, it's not. Okay. Let's give this panel a round of applause, shall we?